So let's talk a little bit. I mean, in your role right now, I guess the first thing we would say, the reason that I had called and contacted you about when you might be in Washington is, of course, uh, President Trump and his team, Peter Navarro and others, began to um, send tremors that perhaps American membership and participation in the WTO was fragile, uh, or at least if not withdrawing from the WTO, that at least passing legislation that might make membership in, in the WTO feel moot. So I'm just interested in, in, in your dashboard right now, leading an institution which is a global institution, and so you're not necessarily concerned with the American, but how, are you, how is, what is the state of affairs? How tense is the WTO today? Let me start there. How tense are you? In fact, uh, WTO is in a good place, it, which is strange. I realize that that is uh, sort of not what you read in the headlines. But the fact is, uh, to me, Buenos Aires was a success. I'm maybe the only fa person on the planet that feels that way. I thought Buenos Aires was a terrible failure. I don't think yeah. so. Mm -hmm. I, it, for the first time, there's an ability to talk about things that you care about. Right. So those that want to talk about uh, e-commerce, and see where they can go with it, and see what the rules ought to be. Three quarters of members re representing three quarters of global GDP are talking about e-commerce. Those who are interested in uh, domestic regulation of services have a forum where it's open, anybody can attend, and they're moving forward with that. Uh, there is a similar forum with respect to uh, investment uh, and how to make world trade more accessible to small, micro, small, and medium enterprises. So four new initiatives. Not everybody likes them. There are some who want to go with the DOI development agenda. They haven't given up their original goals from years ago. But the fact of the matter is there's actual discussion. When it comes to issues like US-China and uh, China's role in the world, there's actual conversation. It is sort of refreshing to go into a room and there's an actual discussion of current problems. I said years ago to a prior director general, why don't you just subscribe to the Financial Times and you'll know what's going on in the world because it's not being discussed in the GATT at the time. And it's Arthur Dunkel. And he said, I do subscribe, but the members won't let me read it. Uh, it, there's a beginning of coming to grips with actual problems. And uh, so the, the normal work of the WTO actually is functioning. Countries notify standards in draft so that others can comment on them, so that can, trade can continue to flow and they can be the least restrictive that is possible. Uh, What's exciting to me, I have a couple of divisions reporting to me. I won't say that agriculture is always exciting. Agriculture is always difficult. Accessions. The countries, that, there are 22 countries trying to get into the WTO, desperate to get into the WTO in varying degrees. Most of them are, have just gone through some terrible uh, economic and, and political problems. Bosnia-Herzegovina. Mm. Uh, uh, Comoros, small, very, very poor c country. Uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Timor Leste. Uh, the last two that came in, Afghanistan and Liberia. Liberia had both Ebola and a domestic civil war, and uh, Afghanistan is, has, still has its issues. Uh, why do they want to come in? They want to raise their land standard of living, have a chance at peace. And when you think about it, the GATT was formed for the purposes of peace. All the, all the rhetoric at the time from various secretaries of state, but also from trade representatives was, we're here to build peace. And that's been true for a very long time. For these countries, it's about peace. So let me push you a little further. Um, I have. Uh, spent the last several days trying to distract myself from Washington uh, and what was happening, well, Helsinki and, and NATO, by reading your speeches. And, and uh, uh, one of them I'm was... very restful uh, kind yeah, of and, thing. And they're very good, and they're all available, by the way. Uh, Deputy Director General Wolf Colin, a crisis can bring good results, um, in which you sort of celebrate World War II, 1930s tariffs, as great opportunities in their time to, to do great things. And, and you... you talk, uh, at least in one of the things I read that you wrote, that Buenos Aires resulted in a, a, a 
really a suspension of the legislative uh, uh, direction, the legislative capacity of the WTO. You lamented that the appellate functions, the the dispute resolution and appellate functions have also, uh, gr you know, ground to a standstill as the United States has blocked the appointment. I guess there are seven uh, appellate, I don't know what they're called, appellate justices, appellate... Uh, appellate body members. Body, body members. Uh, and that we have four now about to get to three and three is a minimum. So you're worried about the appellate function. I mean, what I find interesting about you is you continue to be ridiculously optimistic despite your very realistic assessment in these uh, things about how bad uh, it is for the institution. You keep talking about opportunities, but I haven't seen a better crystallization of all the negative things about the, the international institution. So when you talk about the crisis that you feel today, how do you define the crisis? There is a uh, political pushback, uh, which is understandable, uh, largely because of changes in technology, advances in uh, uh, in technology have caused a lot of displacement and countries in varying degrees haven't handled it very well and I don't think the US has handled it very well uh, either and so there's dissatisfactions blamed on trade unduly to a great extent although globalization has certainly has an effect uh, and it's we're going to go through a rough patch because with uh, you know automated uh, vehicles uh, they're going to be uh, further displacement, uh, and uh, we're going to have, to, there has to be domestic response, domestic policy responses, which are, which are absent, uh, and uh, uh, nothing in the WTO is going to uh, be sufficient to assist those who are displaced by technology and change. Uh, why am I optimistic? Because I think that, uh, in essence, uh, the, uh, there's an economic and political imperative to have open borders. Uh, if I, if I, have a, I have a computer, I create an app, I'm sitting in Keokuk, Iowa, or in, uh, for that matter, Sarajevo, and I want to sell it to somebody, and now the world is open to me because I can correspond with anybody in an instant via the internet. And what government is going to tell me that I don't have the freedom to sell the product of my mind and, and the things I make, whether it's a physical product or otherwise, and say, oh, uh, you can't move that across my border. Uh, I think that there, it's economically rational to have borders, in effect, disappear when it comes to trade, and that will happen over time. And uh, it is uh, politically, uh, there will be an imperative. Young people, the Pew Research polls tell us, are generally in favor of free trade. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that's the wave of the future. Uh, and what Bruce Stokes says is, of course, the answer is for those of us who are older to die. You talk about... AO, I mean, I don't know if Bruce is here. He's supposed to show up, but but yeah, the, you talk about the arc of history and some of this. A O H, you shorten it. Yes. And, 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 and you, your A O H, uh, your arc of history, uh, which you talk about this progression, the institution building, you know, moving through the various phases of of human history, and 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 argue that if you know, for instance, the WTO weren't there today, we would need to set up the WTO. We would need to have a system of rules. And and you you suggest the problem is that it doesn't work very well for the short term. And, and ah, you know, no, I yeah. said that it, 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 there are no guarantees that it, it, that it delivers in the short so term. So let me, let me ask you, a, you know, a, a very direct question. You, when you were the lead attorney on the Fuji uh, uh, Xerox, or the Fuji Kodak case, and you were litigating that, you had a lot of frustrations with the WTO. You had, you had you know, um, uh, I would remember, you know, a fair degree of anger and frustration with subjectivity, the way... Uh, uh, the decision making was going on and you sort of felt like this institution was flopping in directions that were unhealthy uh, and unfair. Now you work for the place, so have you fixed it? <laughs> the, uh, uh, when there is not a, uh, a measure that, when there aren't a series of measures that are overt and, in, uh, and transparent, 
it's very, the WTO is not a fact-finding organization with respect to dispute settlement. And uh, uh, if I could undo what uh, Rufus Yerkes and I did, because he was co-counsel uh, in Brussels, I would say, mm, going to the WTO may be not a great idea for that case. Right. Uh, with a rising economic power, with an economy that is different than our own, uh, less market-driven, which Japan was, the uh, dispute settlement did not work very effectively for us in that case, for Kodak in that case. Uh, I think that, uh, and there was a lot of trade friction, obviously, with Japan. We spent a lot of time uh, with Thomas Johnson and others, yeah. uh, and Clyde Prestowitz on, uh, and Mike Gadbaugh with uh, U.S.-Japan problems. Uh, we have a new rising economic power called China, and it uses mechanisms that are not uh, always transparent, uh, uh, and uh, there will be friction, and there is friction. And uh, in the case of Japan, the, WT the GATT didn't cure the problems in Japan. What cured the problems in Japan was self-interest, where the Japanese government decided that it was in their self-interest to, to uh, open up their economy, to repair, re uh, repeal the all the rules against competition, all the rules against uh, d uh, discounting, the large-scale retail store law, that sort of thing. China has to make some decisions, uh, and a question is being tried again, will external pressure you know, bring about that? There, some things are being brought to the WTO in dispute settlement. We'll see how those goes. Those go, the U.S. and others have said, some things will be negotiated bilaterally, and there are lots of bilateral negotiations. Is China as good as Japan was at using the WTO to protect its interests? The, my understanding is that uh, China engages as a third party, so they're in the room for a lot of the uh, debates that go on with respect to particular cases, and presumably they have gained a fair amount of experience. You know, what the, what the score is, I, don't, I can't tell you. But uh, they certainly invested a lot of effort into understanding the WTO rules. Did we bring China into the WTO too soon? Uh, I am told that I don't have personal opinions anymore. Uh. Uh, I, I think that uh, it, uh, my own view, uh, which I'm not allowed to have, is that it was essential to have China inside, not outside, that uh, a China that was like North Korea would not be in the world's interest, if an isolated China. Uh, that is not probably, uh, there is no WTO opinion on the subject, and I just uh, put my foot into it. So I traveled to Davos with Joe Biden um, in 2017, and America was kind of a, very quickly slipping to the fringes of Davos that year. And the big story was Xi Jinping standing up and saying, don't worry, world. We know Donald Trump has won. We know that chaos is coming. But we will save the world on climate change, and we will save global markets uh, and the liberal market order, essentially. Um, how did, did, did you guys celebrate when Xi Jinping gave that speech? I wasn't there. Uh. <laughs> But I mean, I mean, did the institution feel Do I like that speeches to, with, in with whatever of concern there may be? I mean, yes. I was talking to yeah. Ambassador Hills a moment ago, and I right. won't put her words in the record until she wants to. But I, I, I think it's fair to say that you have some worries about the, the, the resolve of, of, of this country to remain part of the system. And some of the things that are coming down the pike, uh, for instance, nearly every one of our allies is taking us to the WTO uh, on steel or the national security provisions. And so there's going to be a, there's going to be a day where where the United States is confronted by its allies, Canada, France, England, et cetera, on, on uh, these various provisions, uh, these 232 provisions, and I guess there's a 301 that's coming. And, and so America's got a, you know, a, a set of legal cases coming at it, and, it's, and, and there is a sense of fragility about America defending the liberal mar you know, global um, uh, trading order. And I'm just wondering whether or not it sells well with the kind of global bureaucrats of trade that China is saying that they're going to save the day. My, uh, I'm an American watcher, oddly enough, uh, because new administration and uh, 
in the first couple of years of the Obama administration, we didn't know how much engagement there would be. Uh, I think the Bush administration was slow to come coming to the party. There is no evidence whatsoever of lack of engagement by the United States. It's interesting. The U.S. is active uh, with respect to agriculture. Uh, U.S. interests in agriculture haven't changed really at all. There, the U.S. is engaged in the e-commerce discussion. The U.S. is engaged in the uh, domestic regulation of services, the, that new discussion. The U.S. Is very, has a proposal on the table in the standards area, uh, technical barriers to trade. The U.S. has a proposal from last year in uh, uh, requiring notifications with penalties if countries fail to notify when they're obligated to notify. The U.S. is actively engaged in a whole panoply of areas. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever of disengagement, uh, and it's something that I you know, tend to watch closely, being an American and being interested in U.S. participation in the WTO. It's very active. Uh, and uh, in accessions, the U.S. is the most active country. Namely, they put in the investment to say, okay, we've reviewed your laws, the countries that are applying to come in, and uh, we have the following questions as to whether you know, you're really meeting the standards that the WTO has set. So uh, the U.S. Is a, is a highly active participant. There is no indication whatsoever of withdrawal, none. You, you talk also in some of your speeches about, about free and fair trade finally coming together um, in a way I haven't seen many other people talk about. Do you remember that section of your... Vaguely, yes. Yeah, vaguely. So, right. And, I, and I'm, I'm aware of you. We have people like Kurt Ellis, who's advising the administration. I saw Sherrod Brown the other day. Joe Manchin talked about free and fair trade. Uh, Pat Malloy was there. And there seems to be, both Republicans and Democrats, more so than I remember, that are using that sort of clause more and thus, I was fascinated to see that you referred to it. Is, it. is it an illusion to think that there's a possibility that these different pieces of the tectonic part of the trade debate that have been sort of separate could eventually agree on what free and fair trade looks like? I, I, just to put something on the table, I had the ambassadors of France, the deputy ambassador of Canada, uh, the ambassador of Singapore, on stage the other day, and all three of them basically said there's more than enough room to find converging interests in the administration's more hawkish views on trade, particularly with vis-a-vis -vis China on unfair practices. And so whether you see it as a real opportunity or is this just fluff? No, I think that there is uh, a, a real interest. They, there was a paper leaked, uh, naturally things leak, oddly enough, but uh, the... You often leak? Uh, <laughs> uh, Feel free to give me a call. Yeah. <laughs> there, uh, I don't have anything to leak. Uh, no one, no one gives me secrets. So we have no secrets. They, we're open, transparent, and inclusive. I see. Uh, the uh, uh, there's a distinct interest in uh, coming together with respect to a a. a uh, a system that is both fair and, and free. Uh, the trade policy review, which I wasn't present at for uh, China, uh, had a quite an open exchange as to what was expected by other members. Uh, there will be one of the United States, which will be probably as lively, uh, that's coming up before the end of the year. Um, I think there's a distinct interest. Macron, you know, the WTO had faded from view, frankly. Uh, who would write, uh, newspapers uh, laid off their trade reporters years ago. And, I know we're uh, trying to bring them all back. And Yeah, got to yeah. bring them back. Uh, and uh, CEOs, if you said, well, what's, what are the top 10 things that you're interested in? WTO, not a chance. Top 100, oh, well, no, not WTO. All of a sudden, the WTO is, uh, is noticed that, uh, well, what's it doing? Uh, and... The fact is, it's trying to make a, a better world, uh, and it is slow going. It's 164 members, they have to come to a consensus, and, uh, but there is movement, uh, and I find it very heartening. 
do you 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 say that uh, again not to, to, to come back that that leadership and momentum are important it reminds me of what fred Bergston would say that if you don't keep pedaling the bike the bike will fall over and i'm wondering if you you feel like the bike has fallen over and now it needs to be picked up you you talk about the need for leadership and it's just i guess that's the big question you know, i I want to go to John Harwood in this sort of say, you know, what would John Harwood ask? John Harwood would say, is America going to lead? And if America isn't going to lead, then who's going to lead the system? And, and if not, then, then what, what does the world look like if the bike falls over? I mean, the, an interesting thing is Lighthizer, newly minted as U.S. Trade he said Representative. Nice things about you when you got your appointment. Were you surprised? <laughs> he came to Buenos Aires. Uh, which in itself was not known whether he would, whether the U.S. would send a ministerial level individual. And he said, there needs to be reform. And he listed things that the U.S. wanted as reforms. And he got substantial applause. Uh, and that was interesting. And he came home and he said, and we're going to participate in the e-commerce discussions and maybe others that are of interest, which is setting new rules. So, uh, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of pause. There's Macron uh, at the OECD ministerial uh, at uh, the end of May said, we're going to talk about reform. Uh, there is now, there's a lot of, in the air in Geneva, is a lot of, well, what does that mean? What should we do? What's needed? Uh, the EU paper that leaked is a, a menu of EU ideas on reform. The, the stress on the system has catalyzed a response. And the response is, okay, can we do a better job? And there are a number of countries, like France, which a couple of, what generation ago, would not have been in that place, who say, yeah, we can do a better job. And it's not just sort of a north-south uh, situation anymore. Uh, Brazil is in a different place than it was. Argentina is in a different place than it was. Then they're talking about what can we do that would make this place better. So I think that, you know, can we be in a better place in world trade? Yes. There are things to be done. And actually, there's active thought as to what that should be. You know, and it, you know, could we be, do a better job for development? Uh, the WTO was founded, uh, or the GATT was founded, to, for reco economic recovery from World War II through trade. Uh, so, uh, you know, is, are there trade answers to some issues? Yes, there are, and it lies in the direction of openness. Can we get there? You know, it'll take a major effort, but it can be done. From my viewpoint in knowing uh, Bob Lighthizer in, in form 20 years ago, I know he's not anti-trade. I know he's not anti-global trade. He's not a he, he knows the rules. Um, Peter Navarro, I'm not so sure about. So. When you look at Peter Navarro as one personality of this administration versus uh, Bob Lighthizer, do you do you talk to Peter Navarro? Do you have you met and talked to him about his his views and direction? And and I've do you think his, that I've distinction is? Movie. Oh, oh yeah, does that count? Well, sure. <laughs> I haven't actually seen his movie, but but do you? Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm I, I'm interested in the issue of whether or not, in terms of understanding where this administration is and, and, and how fragile things are, you know, I would speculate that Bob does actually believe uh, in, in, in the global trade. He wants to fix things. And I happen to know uh, Pat and I were at dinner the other night, and I, I, I won't divulge it, but there was somebody very interesting and very provocative in the trade field who uh, was being consulted by USTR, who traditionally is on the left, and fixing NAFTA. Uh, as, as, as this person and, 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 and in, in a constructive way. And so this person who I had always heard was sort of an opponent of trade was actually enthusiastic about some of the things they were doing. So there's a difference between being opposed, which I think a lot of people think the, the Trump administration is, and actually being serious and earnest about wanting to work out problems and nuts and bolts and flaws in trade deals. So I'm wondering how you, how you as, as a steady hand in this world, um, perceive it. I mean, what, what we perceive is the administration sent over Dennis Shea mm -hmm. uh, as the ambassador in Geneva representing the United States. He, he's new to the job. He's been there a couple of months. He was, he, oddly enough, hostage taking is not unknown in this town. And so he was, uh, he like Lighthizer were delayed for a substantial period of time. But he's come over and uh, he gives reasoned statements.
uh, in a reasoned tone uh, uh, that are, uh, I think, seen as constructive. Well, he's raised a lot of questions about whether one can deal with China in the dispute resolution process in the WTO. He is a, uh, there was always a question on Kodak case, which you raised, uh, an unfortunate memory. Uh, but it was a really good, good effort. It was an interesting effort. Uh, the, uh, it would be nice if it had turned out a little differently for Kodak. The fact is, Japan did a lot of the things we were asking it to do. They did not do it in the case. Uh, they repealed the premiums law, which prevented... Uh, you couldn't give a prize in a contest that was more than the value of a roll of film. That's not a big motivator. A trip to Hawaii would have been better than just you get a roll of film free. As a, and an import has to compete on the basis of something uh, extra when the dominant brand is well known uh, and you're trying to enter our market. Anyway, the, uh, uh, Japan, Japan did a lot of things to reform and it's a much different country. Uh, one of the things you talked about is investment in the system, uh, which I've talked about. And uh, the United States invested a lot. I think every country, you don't just say, uh, if you give me a concession on this, I'll give you a concession on that. It's you build institutions. And I would like to see, and I think we're beginning to see, other countries, particularly the EU, uh, start to think about how do we build this institution and make it stronger? And uh, I think that's favorable. I think that's a, f a really good development. And it only comes because of the tension that's in the atmosphere. Just, just one more question, and then yeah. I want to go to all right. of you. Um, if a country technically wanted to withdraw from the WTO, what would it have to do? Some uh, X country. I, my understanding, this is not a legal opinion, but I believe this is a termination, this is a, this is a termination clause. You say, we're out of here. And it's so uh, six months notice. I mean, ah, that's a dom Mills. domestic legal question. And th I think this split, the domestic law trade lawyers are somewhat split on the issue. You can't repeal, the president can't repeal law. Right. So, uh, you know, the U.S. is in the government procurement code. All of a sudden, the government procurement code can't have uh, different provisions because the president says we're leaving the WTO. But uh, uh, I have my own views uh, on uh, the the uh, powers of the presidency. And what uh, are some of them? Uh, yes, there are some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and so does the Congress. The Congress yeah. apparently has an interest in its uh, uh, constitutional powers as well, which is uh, interesting. <laughs> well, with that, uh, let me go to Ambassador Hills first. Um, bringing you a microphone. If you have thoughts that you want to share that you can share. <laughs> Carla Hills. Well, it's wonderful to have Alan here. And uh, you're more optimistic than some of us with respect to You should to read the these speeches. They're ridiculously optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> some of us would say about the, the future, uh, if you were advising those of us who believe that the past 70 years in supporting global institutions, in particular the World Trade Organization and rules, how would you motivate the man in the street to appreciate right. what that means, not only to America broadly, but to their circumstance? Great question. You know, I, uh, it sort of uh, uh, requires leadership. Uh, and uh, the leaders of uh, those who are elected officials, those who are CEOs, those who are in NGOs, uh, have to treasure what was built by the United States and its allies over time and convey that. And it's a, it's a constant effort. Uh, I think that uh, I, I have doled out a lot of criticism and received a fair amount myself for, as a result, uh, uh, that uh, business in the United States has underinvested in the WTO. Uh, 
uh, that uh, uh, it, it, and it's true of other organizations, uh, in uh, there's a lot that the WTO contributes that I'm learning about, uh, on the job learning. Uh, the WTO helps move food from trade surplus countries to trade deficit countries. So those who care about development uh, should care about the fact that trade can move agricultural products, food products across borders. The, w the things I'm involved in, like um, uh, the, uh, there's a assistance to developing countries for um, re bringing their standards up with respect to uh, sanitary and phytosanitary standards, so food. That uh, and food products, plant products, uh, standards bar trade to a much greater extent currently than tariffs, although they can be shifted. With a little of effort, you could get tariffs up sufficiently so that standards are less of a concern. But the fact is, 98% of world trade is governed by standards, doesn't move at all. When, what is the Brexit problem on the Irish border? I, I think actually you have to give examples. One thing in, uh, with respect to the, the, the public. Why are the Irish upset? Uh, in part because they're afraid trade will no, no longer cross between the Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, why won't it? It is not going to be probably tariffs. They could have a free trade agreement. That's not it. It is whether the standards are going to be acceptable whether there's an evolution of standards that's different than the EU's evolution of standards. Uh, one thing, and I'm wandering away from your question a little bit. But back to the person on the street. Back to, <laughs> back to the person on the street. I was going to go in the direction of the, uh, uh, for a moment. The, <laughs> the British cabinet memo that leaked that said that if Britain gets an agreement like it, Norway has with the EU, they lose 2% of their GDP by the year 2035. If they have a Canadian-style free trade agreement with the EU, Britain loses 5% of its GDP by 2035. If they get uh, a WTO agreement, that is loss of 8% 8, 8 of GDP. That is uh, a staggering loss of British GDP, and they don't disown that memo. Uh, why do they want to do it? They want to do it for reasons of greater freedom and with respect to regulation. Uh, I asked our chief economist, Bob Koopman, who used to be chief, chief of operations at the ITC here, uh, what's that mean for the world economy if we were a single market versus what the WTO now provides, he said, $89 trillion loss of GDP for the world by between now and 2035, back of the envelope calculation. All of Africa's GDP is $3.3 trillion. So the loss to the world is enormous. Uh, may not be good for the, to explain to the man on the street, but it is tangible what we lose in terms of productivity, in terms of capacity. You know, what could we do with a few extra trillion dollars? We might have the potholes repaired on my way in to work. Uh, you know, we could do a few things. So uh, I think examples are better than, the theory isn't gonna sell anybody. But real, real short yeah. for a minute, I want to tell you, yeah. just piggyback on this for a minute. I interviewed uh, the CEO of GE Appliances the other day. I'm thinking about Mike Gadboss. So the GE Appliances is actually booming right now, investing country, because it was bought by the Chinese. Um, they're expanding and, and whatnot. But the, but the CEO made an interesting comment that because of the steel tariffs and because of the trade war that's building, their prices are going to go up. And it, and it takes me back to you seeing an opportunity in a crisis in the man on the street, man or woman on the street, that, that is buying a refrigerator, a stove, a, a dryer, or whatever, that they're gonna feel in the ticket price for what they're paying a surge in prices across the board. Does that then remind them, is that a useful reminder then uh, that actually fair tariff reductions at some level are worth achieving because they haven't, like, I haven't thought about trade in probably 15 years. I saw Thelma Askey and some of you, you know, Amy Porges here. I mean, this is really the cool old crowd. 
I mean, young versions of the of o old crowd, but but um, it's kind of like Rip Van Winkle. All this stuff has come back, and and uh, I mean, don't you think? And so I'm wondering whether people have lost that kind of tangible feel that trade matters, and maybe I th I think the shock of the tariffs is good. I well, I. Uh there's a limit to how much shock one s system can take. But uh, the fact of the matter is, yeah, I think that there are lessons to be learned from the application of tariffs and there, that it's uh, not entirely positive. Mm, interesting. Uh, Dana Marshall. And John and then Mike Gadbo. I'm, you all, I, John Harwood I love, so you, know, you, you can cut off anybody else when you want. Uh, Dana? Your old, your old law buddy. Well, Indeed. I was going to, I was going Did he do well at the firm? <laughs> Spectacularly. Okay, great. Uh, Alan, welcome to your extended family here. You've been living with us for decades. <laughs> welcome back. Um, there's a lot of ways to ask the question, and, and I'm a little reluctant because you said that you've had to leave your personal opinions at the door before moving to WTO, but maybe there's a way you can answer this question in some sense. Um, for those of us who are concerned about the actions of state uh, capitalism. And for those of us who are also concerned that there be more of a multilateral approach to dealing with them rather than a unilateralist approach, I guess the question is, is there scope in an organization like the WTO, perhaps exp with some expanded abilities, to be able to resolve problems that are now apparently being resolved unilaterally? Is there anything, any idea you can, can, I mean, or is it pretty much uh, the case that whether a future administration or this administration wants to modify its approach, that they might as well, they might do some other things, but probably not looking to Geneva very much anymore for the mm -hmm. really difficult problems? Great question. It seems to me, uh, uh, that as a colorless international bureaucrat, that uh, if you have uh, a, a narrow road, half of it is within the WTO rules, half of it's outside the rules, and you decide, well, we're gonna drive on both sides because that, un that allows us to go more quickly, and the other side decides it's gonna drive on both sides of the road, that actually isn't gonna work very well what you have to do is broaden the lane of the rules. And that's exactly what sort of thinking is going on now. Namely, how do you bring issues that are not clearly within the rules, some things are and some things are not, Thick intellectual property within the theft. rules. Uh, is that in the rules? There's an answer. No, no, but I mean, but I'm just uh, just no, saying, I, you know, uh, an example. You of, know, of am I going to uh, comment on an existing case? Before no, I'm not asking about an existing case. I'm just saying in general. In general, is intellectual property theft within the rules? We're going to find out how much is within the rules and how much isn't. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John Harwood, and then and then over here. I'd just like to ask, um, there's been a lot of talk about the current administration um, going after international arrangements and ins institutions. Uh, uh, Robert Kagan wrote a piece the other day saying he had taken a sledgehammer to NATO. Um, I just wonder whether you believe that or expect that at the end of the Trump presidency, whenever that is, four years, eight years, that the international architecture will look pretty much the same this will prove to be more uh, sound than actual um, damage, destruction, or not? Well, uh, one thing I lived through uh, due to extreme age is uh, the import surcharge in 1971. Uh, President Nixon put on an import surcharge, 10% on all countries. And uh, there was no legitimacy under the GATT because at the time you couldn't, for balance of payments purposes, you couldn't use tariffs, you had to use quotas. The US had no defense other than we could have done worse, we could have put on quotas, you wouldn't have liked that. We were condemned by a working party, uh, all but 
two. We don't know why the other country voted with us. We were clearly illegitimate under the current rules. What happened? The, why did we put on the surcharge? Because the U.S. had to devalue. Others didn't want us to devalue. We were tied to, the dollar was tied to gold, and we were running out of gold. The French, oddly enough, were cashing in all their dollars for gold, and the planes were flying out of Fort Knox every night, and it was unsustainable. So what happened? Smith, so Smithsonian agreement uh, and uh, got a devaluation, moved to floating exchange rate system as a result, asked for unilateral concessions from Canada, the Europe, Europe, and Japan. They said, no way. We got the Tokyo round of multilateral trade negotiations, got the first three non-tariff barrier agreements. What's the moral of that story? You can get to a better place from a crisis. What was the justification legally for the import surcharge that the Supreme Court upheld? National security. Oddly. Uh, it a little bit random. Uh, it was, uh, uh, but the fact is we had a crisis and we got to a better place. It is possible. Will we, will we this time through? Because there's, there are enough little crises around. If the appellate body is not fixed, what, Azevedo, what Roberto Azevedo, Director General, says, we have trade wars. How does that happen? You say, I bring a case against you. I won. Now you change what you were doing that's been found to be illegitimate. They say, we're appealing. And you say, but there is no appeal. They say, uh, so I say, well, I'm going to retaliate. I'm go and the other side says, well, I'm going to retaliate. Well, it sounds a little familiar because it's what, where we are now. Only you have a proliferation of trade wars. So do we need an appellate body? Yes, we do. Is there an ability to get to an appellate body? Yes, there is. Is it a crisis that gets us to that point? There is no other way. So what you're saying is that the Trump shocks can be constructive as long as you get an appeals body in place. I'm saying that you can. I'm not in favor of crises. But if you have a crisis, you ought not to waste it. Mike Gadbaugh. Bill. So uh, speaking as a man on the street, uh, <laughs> it seems to me that yeah. we. Wait, John's taken off, and all of you should follow his Twitter feed. Thank you, John. I'm going to come up to Kurt next. Go ahead. It seems to me we had a, a, a formula for managing trade in this country, and you've been really talking about it. It was created in 1975. You helped to mastermind that and engineer it. And it was a sophisticated mix of presidential authority to go out and negotiate trade liberalization, but also a fair amount of authority to deal with unfair and fair trade by putting on restrictions. And I'm reminded in 1977, uh, we had a trigger price mechanism that affected all imports of steel products under the anti-dumping law, uh, masterminded by Tony Solomon, who was the founding chairman of the Peterson Institute. And we know that is uh, soundly on the side of good economics. Um, and that formula, but that occurred as we were negotiating the Tokyo Round and the trigger price mechanism survived the Tokyo Round conclusion. So unfair trade practice, a, a robust set of measures to deal with fair and unfair trade went along with successful trade liberalization. Along comes the WTO, uh, and it seems to me the administration is arguing, and I, I'm sure, I know Bob Lighthizer is more articulate than I am, that the WTO basically either the rules or more likely the interpretation of the rules by the appellate body, cut back the policy space that governments, particularly the United States, have always used to deal with really domestic problems uh, that were tied in with fair and unfair trade. And it wasn't just protectionism. You alluded to the semiconductor agreement. That was part of a whole competitiveness strategy. Uh, Wasn't this did, kind of part of the Washington consensus? It was the Washington consensus, but in the, in the unique circumstance of the United States, trade measures that were seen by some as protectionists... They used to be all under one were roof. Part Carla of a Hills was doing it all under one roof, right? They were part the, yeah. of a competitiveness strategy. Yeah. We did antitrust reform. We did intellectual property rights reform. We, did, we used it to do what, of course, we couldn't call it, industrial policy. Right. And it saved a very important industry.
did the WTO or the appellate body or both get it wrong? And uh, is this reform that you're alluding to have to really revisit the question of how much policy space do governments, in particular the United States, need in order to deal with these uh, problems? My v do you want an answer? Yeah. I'm just pointing ah. to Shireen. The, uh, my, my view is that uh, it is possible to come to a reasoned solution to the current impasse over the appellate body. To do that, the U.S. Uh, has to really understand what is in the minds of the EU and others who value the current system as it stands. And the EU and others have to understand what it is that is of concern to the United States. Uh, otherwise, there will be no appellate body. And it's true, but it's true of any negotiating issue. You really have to understand what is motivating the other side so that you can deal intelligently with it. Uh, but I think there's, there is a solution. Uh, and the issues that you raise, I think, are uh, articulate the U.S. view. Uh, uh, since Bob Lighthizer really isn't uh, uh, addressing it quite as explicitly at this point, you'll be his surrogate for these purposes. But uh, it is the U.S. view, I believe, and it has to be understood, just as the U.S. really has to understand the view of others. One example is uh, the newly exceeding countries say, well, whatever you thought you were doing, we like the way it is. We joined, we joined the WTO after all of this, and we sort of like the way the appellate body is functioning. And the fact that you think it was a different deal, that really doesn't matter. One iota to us, uh, we think this is a good system. And actually, folks have to compare uh, uh, notes on uh, what, it, what they really need, what is needed in the system to move forward. And I think there is a place, there is a place out there, if there's engagement, and there's beginning to be engagement for the first time. Uh, and it's again, a, a crisis gives, uh, uh, sort of gives impetus to having to, well, we have to think about this. And there is thought taking place. I and want, may I say, you're a very, very well-informed person on the street. Yeah, yeah. Back to the man on the street, uh, Mike Gadball. I want to go to Kurt, but I want to ask you just one quick question. I'm looking back here, I'm not being rude. While I'm looking on this cell phone, I'm looking back at former director generals. And I've often had this theory about trade officials, that sometimes it's useful when they're celebrities and sometimes not. And Pascal Lamy, I've had the privilege of interviewing him for time, became an extremely well-known personality on the global trade scene. And when I think about Mike's comment, he sort of represent that Fred Burkston-style Washington consensus beat you over the head with, with a kind of neoliberal ethic. It was very different, very un-French in some ways. Um, and whether or not that created a real problem and a backlash for the WTO institutionally, I've never heard of your new director general for whom you work, Roberto Azevedo. And maybe that's a good thing. What do you think? You ought to meet with him. Yeah. You ought to have him here. He's much better uh, with a microphone than I am. Uh, at Buenos Aires... Do you Aires, think it's yeah. useful not to be high profile and to be more seen as a technician and a problem solver than someone out as a global personality? I mean, did, does that make any sense? He I mean, Carla, you were a pers global personality, but we needed one then, right? So. So for those watching online, uh, Ambassador Hills thinks celebrity works. Um, yeah, yeah. He, uh, Azevedo, uh, spends a heck of a lot of time on the road giving speeches, and uh, he also meets with heads of state. Well, we'll invite uh, him. Maybe we'll do it. Uh, Kurt Ellis. Absolutely. And then Bill. And then, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've been working on trade issues for 15 years. I'm sorry John Harwood left the room because the last time I saw him was at a congressional race in upstate New York in 2004 that was predicated entirely on the issues of free trade and NAFTA and the effect of the man on the street. And it was at that point 
that I realized this is the issue that will change politics in America if you have a suitable personality exploited on a national stage. I had to wait 12 years to see that happen, but it did come true. Um, and it's been a very interesting conversation. Um, you had noted that uh, there's a limit to how much shock people can take. <laughs> Talking about tariffs, I would say that applies to the man on the street. There's a limit to how much shock people can take from globalization. And that's why we're seeing President Trump, Mr. Trump, become President Trump. But um, I just have you know, sort of general questions. Considering that the general thrust and development of technology over this long, broad arc of history has been toward decentralization, from railroads to trucks, to you know cars, uh, from mainframe computers to you know handheld personal computers. Why, at that same time, would governance become more centralized, from nation states or from you know subsidiarity under Catholic social teaching to centralize to a, a body in Geneva? I mean, doesn't that go against the arc of history? Uh, and isn't the danger of having a single set of rules governing development models, the danger is if that single set of rules is wrong, you've now shackled the entire planet to a single set of rules. Isn't there a danger there? I mean, this is sort of the hypothesis that Jared Diamond put forth in Guns, Germs, and Steel. Why did Europe overtake China? China was the technological leader a thousand years ago. It's because they came under the rule of one emperor and when that one emperor decided he didn't want this technology or Facebook. he didn't want that, uh, there was no place for the entrepreneur to go. Whereas in Europe, they could go shop it to the Duke or Duchess or Ducky, <laughs> Ducky <laughs> next door. Uh, if if uh, you know the, right. the Prince of Genoa did not want to look for a new trade route to the east, well, go to Queen Isabella and you'll find somebody to sponsor you. So isn't that the danger of having one set of rules for everybody? Great question, but I'm going to talk to you about platform monopolies at drinks later. Um, but yes, sir. And then, and then in the middle, Bill Frymore. WTO doesn't govern. Uh, the rules it sets uh, create enormous amounts of policy space. Uh, if you uh, decide that, um, you know, an endangered species is uh, something that you're going to not trade in, you don't trade in it. Uh, so there's plenty of policy space of all sorts. And uh, the question is really, partially, uh, you know, consumer choice, national choice. Countries can choose policies that they want to choose. What they can't do is uh, restrict the ability of others to sell in their market if they've promised not to do it. Uh, but there's no compulsion whatsoever uh, other than to live up to their obligations. Bill, Fry Moore. Yeah. Are we going to Mike? Mike, Mike. Yes, sir. I'm kind of following up with uh, Mike Gadbaugh's comments and Dana's comments, and maybe a little more pointedly asking, what can the WTO do to address this, let's call it what it is, the crisis on dispute resolution? But it's, it's broader than that in terms of, you know, basically a U.S.-China face-off on many issues. And there's all sorts of issues that that are not in the WTO purview, such as state-owned enterprises, such as, um, uh, uh, you know, basic, basic uh, inv investor rights, um, and most importantly, global, global overcapacity. Right, so let's... And so my question is, um, there's been several, Macron, let's talk about Macron in a little more detail. He made an interesting proposal to bring, could there be an informal dialogue? Could Acevedo either convene it or be the behind the scenes facilitator of it, where you have China, the EU, US at a minimum, and several, whatever the appropriate other players might be. The big problem with the WTO decision making so quick, is, is, is it not the fact that every country has one vote, and obviously you can't right. mitigate that, but what informally can be done to restore what used to be US-EU determining 
what goes forward as recently as the formation of the WTO. How can we get great, some great centralized question. authority? We're, we're near the end, and before you answer, I'm going to just quickly grab a couple of other questions, and I'll keep track. We'll go to Thelma. Uh, we're going to bring you the mic real quick, but let's make them real 30-second versions. No, Thelma Askey for folks, another great yeah. architect of trade. <laughs> there are so many issues yeah. here, but I just want to focus on uh, what you said about uh, trade open borders in in uh, kind of an atmosphere of re uh, borderlessness. Yes, borderlessness in the atmosphere of defining borders more specifically. Right. But it, it does seem like we we have this conflict with the flexible economies in the U.S. and the less flexible economies in the EU, and. The more restrict right now we're talking a lot, as you say, about how to shoehorn some additional issues into rules right. that we are not certain about. Got it, Mike Massetti, and then and then and then Peter will wrap this up. You've both Actually. alluded to things being said and done in Congress. Do you see these efforts, some efforts anyway, about reasserting their constitutional role in trade? Is this real or is this? some sort of flash in the pan that will be gone by November. Okay, and lastly, Pat Malloy. Uh, use the mic, Pat. The WTO charter, there, I understand, Pat, there are says millions that of people who want to hear these last add, words from you. You cannot add to or detract from what the governments have agreed on. I think that's the problem with the appellate body. Article 21, we use that to defend what we've done on aluminum and steel. Other countries are already countering us by putting tariffs on us. The Swiss have not. They said, we're going to take you to the WTO. Don't you think if the WTO rules on that Article 21, contrary to what the U.S. is saying, you're going to run into a huge political problem in the WTO? Okay, great. So let's finish there. So first is uh, Bill's question on crisis of dispute resolution, and can't we go back to sort of dealing with some of the key stakeholders, uh, essentially coming to a new equilibrium, essentially, on a, on a deal? I think that uh, on all the, the, the broad agenda, the, the what I alluded to is uh, you know when uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, said uh, there ought to be consideration of reform. It not only resonated, but it started a, a fair amount of activity. Uh, I could say it started with Bob Lighthizer, but actually Macron uh, seems to. Uh, uh, have motivated uh, near-term activity, and things have evolved since uh, Buenos Aires. So uh, the EU is talking to China about reform. The US, uh, EU, and Japan are uh, considering what sort of reforms ought to take place uh, with respect to issues like overcapacity. It's on the agenda of them, and they matter. Uh, there are others who are talking about uh, potential changes. So uh, there's a fair amount of ferment. And, uh, you know, ferment can either lead to chaos or it leads to a, a better or a good wine. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I think things are headed in a, in a reasonable um, direction. Uh, you know, if you read, um, I, uh, yeah, uh, whatever one thinks about the relative roles of the branches of the U.S. Um, uh, under the Constitution, the branches of the U.S. government, uh, Orrin Hatch uh, took to the floor today and made a statement uh, of increased interest in getting a, a, a voice in trade. There was a the Corker resolution last week. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't perhaps the most... Um, uh, robust of possibilities, but 88 members said, oh yeah, we, we should have some role, we'll think about that. So, you know, there is ferment domestically, I think, as well as internationally, and it can get to a better place. Um, uh, the, the history of Article 21 is that countries have shied away from uh, attempting to get through litigation a definition of what is and what is not within national security in Helms-Burton way back when, uh, the U.S. Uh, and the EU worked something out. Right now there are two cases, we're thinking about our own situation of steel, but actually there are two cases pending of Qatar and its neighbors uh, and uh, Ukraine and Russia. 
And, uh, so the Qatar embargo is a WTO dispute case? Yes, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, there will be opportunities for either countries to work things out. I mean, the, the whole idea and, uh, behind dispute settlements actually resolve the dispute. And if countries can work things out, uh, that's great. If they don't, uh, they have recourse to the dispute settlement process. Uh, but one would hope that uh, in very sensitive areas that countries find a mutually satisfactory resolution. Not impossible. So my, the big, the bottom line from Alan Wolf is fix the appellate body is what I'm hearing and the rest is negotiable, right? Mm. <laughs> there's, there's a lot to be, there's a lot of, of, uh, of things to be fixed from every member's perspective. You know, is the WTO good enough for developing countries? What will help them the most? It's worth discussing. Uh, you know, is uh, the, we didn't, I, none, nobody here raised fish, fishery subsidies. Uh, it is. Out of time, it was next. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you know, the world's oceans are being fished out, and it's a south south issue. It's not American That's fish that is, uh, that is being, uh, you know, not, not U.S. Uh, fishermen's incomes that are being uh, curtailed. It is. Uh, I should note that others. tilapia and lobster are both part of the, uh, the uh, current trade war. So there you go. I, I we can that. end on that note. I would, uh, on, that, on that very optimistic, I really want to thank uh, Alan uh, for joining us and all of you. And I really tried hard in our invitations today to make sure that we had every corner of the trade equation uh, in the room. And I think we accomplished that. Uh, and Alan, uh, congratulations on your uh, service and, and appointment as Deputy Director General of the WTO. And we would love to have you back often to give us updates on your optimism. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.